Poštovani gledalci, dobrodošli u N1 intervju. Tema ovog intervjua je, kao što se vjerovatno i navikli proteklih nekoliko sedmica, Ukrajina odnosi između Ukrajine i Rusije, ali isto tako geopolitička situacija. Jedan od onih koji vrlo dobro poznaju Vladimira Vladimiroviča Putina je Mihajl Mihajlović Kasijanov, koji je bio Putinov prvi premijer, ali prije toga bio ministar financija, nakon toga opozicioni čelnik u uh, Rusiji. Čovjek koji dobro poznaje cijelu situaciju i sve ono što se dešava. Uh, Mr. Kasijanov, welcome to program N1. Hello, happy to be with you. You were the first prime minister of Vladimir Putin in 2000, but before that you were finance minister of Russia under the president um, Yeltsin. And you know very well how administration functions in um, Russia, especially now that vertical of power, uh, which is so many times mentioned over the last several weeks. But I want to ask you um, is this, how these sanctions and everything what is going on as a response of the West to uh, Russia will affect average Russian and Russian society, not only the oligarchs and the president and those closest to him? Uh, all right. Let me first mention that uh, last time I saw Vladimir Putin, it was 17 years ago. Just I knew how the administration worked in my time when there was separation of power and the government was just, um, uh, I would say, independent to a great extent and the parliament too. But now that's a completely different situation. And you correctly explained that there is a vertical of power and uh, there is only one one uh, uh, source of power and there is only one place where decisions decisions made that is president mr putin in particular and in fact right now of course um, we have to somehow understand how it happened that uh, now the putin's regime invaded in a sovereign country ukraine and uh, annexed the half of this territory in fact we have to, 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 to come back to 2008, when uh, Ukraine and Georgia uh, asks for a special, I would say, a roadmap to, uh, to be entered into, to, be, to join NATO in 2008. And at that time, Mr. Putin decided to stop all those intentions and invade and provoked the, the war in Georgia and invade in Georgia and de facto uh, cut uh, one sort of territory of Georgia uh, and uh, recognize independence, or at least it, it means just um, uh, controlling two territories, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And at that time, the, the ceasefire plan just was designed and uh, uh, Mr. Putin and his regime promised to, uh, to stop all this invasion and to stop all this war and withdraw all troops. But nevertheless, three months passed. None of the points were implemented, but the West decided to come back to relations with Mr. Putin's regime uh, in the form of business as usual. And Mr. Putin taken this as a permission to behave this way. And then we see 2014, annexation of Crimea, and war in eastern Donbass, eastern Ukraine, Donbass. And in fact, uh, the reaction was a little bit harder, but not uh, hard enough, just those sanctions which were imposed on that type. Of course, uh, influence on, um, on, on Putin, Russians, Russia's economy at that time, but it was not enough. And we uh, recently saw one month ago, before invasion, Mr. Putin said that we knew what those sanctions were and we are prepared to overcome that. But Right now, the transatlantic unity and uh, in particular just uh, European Union unity inside the Union uh, demonstrate just very harsh and very tough reaction on that. The sanctions were very hard and I would say with the devastating effect, uh, although still there is some kind of, of holes like um, uh, purchase of oil and gas. But still, it is very tough sanctions, and Mr. Putin was shocked. He didn't expect that such reactions would take place. And right now, of course, he is very nervous and angry on the whole world that um, his expectation that um, uh, the, the, the West would digest uh, his another mis, uh, misbehavior, this, uh, I would say, criminal activity, because this war is criminal war, uh, 
but the reaction, the reaction was uh, completely different, uh, not expected on that level. It, it would affect, it already affects the uh, Russian financial system and economy. In a few months, that will be much easier, I wouldn't say easier, it will be, uh, everyone, every Russian will, will understand and would feel what sanctions uh, brought to them, to their life, especially people in the middle class. The poor people, they were poor before, there's 20 million people out of 145 million Russians. Um, uh, but 20 million poor, they didn't, wouldn't feel this because they, they're poor already. But people living in the cities, middle class, they will feel it, that there were cuts of many of uh, already, I would say, um, uh, everyday style um, uh, uh, things, just they will not, will not, will not live in the same, in the same way. And of course, they will start, I believe, they will start reconsidering uh, the problems and will start reconsidering all events taking place around right now, to reconsider just the whole attitude to this war, to this Putin's invasion. Uh, unfortunately, quite a lot of people in Russia support Putin's invasion. I wouldn't say majority, but a lot. I'm very much disappointed because of that, but it is clear because just very, I would say, um, sophisticated propaganda foolish them completely and they uh, continue or even some of them started to believe that Putin has reasons to invade but that, that's uh, absolutely not true there is no any basis there is no reason there is no any provocative uh, activity of Ukraine there was nothing uh, done by the West to provoke for such a, a war uh, before I ask you about that in detail, uh, there is uh, one data element which says that in 1996 you have reached agreement with the Paris and London club to uh, open Russia to the international markets. So it looks like that what you did in 96, uh, Putin basically destroyed in one day when he started this war uh, with uh, Ukraine on February 24th. That's correct. That's correct. In fact, uh, in 2000, in uh, 19, uh, 1996, that was the, the agreement with the creditors of Soviet Union. Uh, Soviet Union. We inherited, Russia inherited uh, the whole 100% of Soviet Union debts. And we inherited this. And that was the agreement with the Western creditors of Paris Club and London Club to reschedule these debts so that to postpone payments uh, on a long period of time. And that, what, and that allowed Russia to come to international capital markets. And since 1913, the Tsarist Russia, since that time, to, to, for, for the first time to be recognized as an international financial partner in the market. And uh, since that time, Russia was absolutely a reliable borrower. Um, uh, and in fact, these days, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Putin canceled uh, the, the paying, paying um, interest on the, on, on the due dates on those bonds which were issued recently by Russian government. In fact, in fact, someone, someone can argue with me that uh, the international reserves of central bank were frozen. Uh, that's that's correct, but I should remind that every day Russian government, Russian Federation, gets one billion U.S. dollar payments for oil and gas, and this would be much more than enough to service to service these debts and these bonds which are right now in default or coming to default. That is simply uh, the deliberate intention of Mr. Putin to somehow to press. Western creditors that um, in, in return of frozen of freezing international reserves of central bank just not to pay not to service not to pay to foreign creditors I think that is absolutely wrong behavior that destroys the whole basis for Russia reputation that will um, will bring us to the situation that Russia would need maybe a decade to reestablish the trust in international markets so that uh, to start to start funding its budget, to start um, uh, uh, placing uh, debts among uh, foreign creditors. Unfortunately, that's the case. That is irresponsible, reckless behavior of President of Mr. Putin. That I think that is 
all what he is doing now, the war and all these activities around the war that is contrary to long-standing interests of the Russian Federation and Russian people. You have mentioned that he is uh, mad, but that he also tried to do uh, business as usual with, with the West. And there is a question about those security um, guarantees, which he has said that uh, he and uh, foreign minister have said that they have them from the West, that the West promised them that the NATO would not move to the eastern flank of um, NATO. But um, I spoke with so many people on the West who told me there is no such a guarantees given by the West to um, Russia, not in the 90s, not in, in the 2000s. Um, do you know about any of those um, guarantees that NATO will not move to the eastern flank? And also, you said, um, I'm going to back to the word mad. Uh, Mikhail Hodorkovsky says that he is at this moment practically mad because nothing goes as he planned in um, Ukraine at this um, point. There is so many generals that um, uh, also uh, mid and high ranking officials are also uh, killed in Ukraine. Ukraine has surprised him. Will he escalate this uh, war just because nothing goes as he has planned? Uh, you mentioned just uh, so many questions simultaneously. Let try to answer them step by step. First, about just Mr. Putin, whether he is mad or not, uh, I don't think just we have we can make a medical, I would say, uh, judgment on that. That's I'm not a doctor and uh, just not even close out to that. That's why just I cannot say anything from the medical point of view. But I can say from political mentality, from political behavior, responsibility. That's. Uh, he's absolutely mad politically because just to behave this way that's that's absolutely unexpected that's contrary to the 21st century of all features of life of the whole world he wants us to bring just to 19th century and try to establish the the sphere of influence something like that that's absolutely out out of any understanding of normal people in 21st century that's why i'm saying this politically mad <laughs> Uh, second question about just guarantees. Of course, the whole, the main guarantee is uh, the good relations with the West. And in my time, when I was head of the government, and that time just I was publicly saying uh, that I dream my country soon would be a full-fledged member of NATO. We had excellent relations with the European Union. My cabinet had a joint meetings with European commissions. We launched just the the spheres and many projects for cooperation and we're, we're dreaming about just establishing a free trade zone from Vladivostok to Lisbon and uh, a visa-free zone from Vladivostok to Lisbon. We announced ourselves, European Union and Russia, as a strategic partners. That was 2003. But later what happened, just we know, uh, and also relations with United States and NATO in particular. That's, that's very good. At that time, there was special committee, Russia and NATO committee was established. And uh, that was one step for close cooperation. Just close cooperation and trust between NATO and Russia, that is the security guarantee. About promises. Promises, in fact, could be given uh, to first president, uh, the only president of, of Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, or could be given to the first president of uh, Russian Federation, Mr. Yeltsin. I knew all of both of them just uh, very well. I had uh, the intensive talks with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and he said there was no such a promise. There was a promise just not to move to eastern eastern Germany because just there were Russian troops still there and there was a Russian um, uh, uh, camps there. Just. But there was no discussion about NATO, NATO expansion, exp expansion. That was that was an absolutely different topic. And he confirmed, and even in, not only to me, but he given one of the interviews when he said the same, that there was no promises given that NATO would not enlarge. Mr. Yeltsin, first president of Russia, I knew them very well, and I discussed many times this issue. Of course, there was no such a discussion. There was a discussion of potential joining uh, Russia and NATO. And that discussion was Mr. Putin and me of joining NATO. And Mr. Putin at that time said, just more softer way compared with me. He said, I don't exclude, while I wanted Russia to, to join NATO. 
That's why there was just the clear policy of Russia, of our government at that time, for close cooperation with the West, at least if not membership of NATO, but close cooperation and trusts between us and NATO. But later, Mr. Putin appeared to be a different person. President Yeltsin and me, we thought at that time that Putin was devoted to democratic principles and he wanted to continue leading Russia of building up a, a market democracy. But a few years after my departure, I think in 2006 and 2007, and his speech in Munich, he already said, we're turning our policy just in opposite direction. He said that Russia uh, surrounded, uh, 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 surrounded by enemies and started already blackmailing just the West. This was absolutely, absolutely, I wouldn't say shocking at that time, but it was absolutely um, unexpected position of uh, president of Russia who behaved completely different just two years before that. And since that time, we already mentioned 2008 Georgia, 2014 Ukraine, uh, Crimea, part of this, and, and, and the war in Ukraine, and what we have now, just dictatorship, complete dictatorship. That's a completely different country, completely different person. Mr. Putin right now behaves as he is, is himself a, a real one, KGB agent with the mentality, I would say, with the a special uh, uh, mentality of, uh, of, 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 of person from the security service. That's why it is difficult uh, to people to realize why the president of the country behaved this way uh, and makes uh, his uh, uh, decisions and activity which contrary to future of, of Russians and future of the country. Um there is a question of rhetoric coming from um, Kremlin, especially from him and from um, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov um, regarding Ukraine, that denazification, um, also getting rid of uh, drug dealers and all kinds of names and attributes given to the leaders of um, Ukraine. Uh, why? Why they need that kind of rhetoric and propaganda to be used, um, not only from Kremlin, but also on the East River in, in uh, New York in uh, Security Council, because we know that Ambassador Nibanzia is always repeating and repeating those same uh, words when uh, they are addressing uh, Ukraine. Is that because they just want to diminish Ukraine uh, or they want to uh, convince their own people, Russians, that the Ukraine had uh, invaded? the uh, Russia uh, in this war? Uh, in fact, they have nothing to say more than that. That was instruction of Mr. Putin. For Mr. Putin, the main goal of the war is to subordinate Ukraine. First of all, to, to press Ukrainian government by invading and pressing Ukrainian government to recognize annexation of Crimea. Mr. Putin is uh, absolutely, uh, absolute, I wouldn't say mad, but he is uh, about Crimea. That's priority number one for him. He was waiting for eight years, expecting that the West would recognize. He would, he, he would thought, he thought that he would bribe uh, uh, Western politicians, and within a few months they will recognize Crimea as a part of Russia, of Putin's Russia. See, uh, eight years passed, but uh, nothing that that recognition happened. That's why Mr. Putin is very much. Uh, 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 disturbed by this fact. And um, uh, NATO uh, continue to say, which is uh, the doors of NATO is absolutely open for everyone, including Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova, etc. And Mr. Putin believed that sooner or later, uh, Ukraine would, would become a member, a member of NATO. It means just uh, the, the, the future of Crimea would be put on the table again. And this will be somehow just absolute, I would say, discrediting Mr. Putin. He doesn't want this to happen. That's why all other denazification, demilitarization, and other, that's simply uh, artificial arguments. There is nothing closer to it. That's absolute lie. 
and all, of course, people, starting with the foreign minister and other ministers and deputy ministers, whatever, they, they are obliged to use these arguments explaining. Of, of course, they understand there is nothing similar to that in existing reality. That's simply explanation or just artificial reasons why Russia had to invade. NATO never created a danger for Russia. In fact, right now, we, we have the Baltic states which are members of NATO. For instance, we have from the border of Estonia to St. Petersburg only 150 kilometers. The NATO already close by. Why should artificially create just the problem that Ukraine would create a problem if uh, uh, entering not NATO? That is just for Russians, for those people who don't want uh, to uh, go in details and understand reality. That's propaganda. That's nothing to do. Crimea, that's, that's the case. The democratic development of uh, successful democratic development of Ukraine as an example to Russian people that Slavic country like Ukraine could be successful and could develop in a, in a very effective way. And uh, why Russians have a dictatorship and degrading because we already have nine years in a row de decreasing of uh, level of real income of people. The, the quantity of poor people is growing every year, while Russia is the richest country in the world, having so much resources of natural resources and having so much profit. And we have the budget surplus budget as 10% of GDP, which no one country has it. But where those money are, people could start asking questions. That's why the only way is propaganda and external victories. Ukraine appeared to be a tough story. I'm very much, uh, I would say, uh, I wouldn't say disappointed. I'm shocked what, what's going on in Ukraine. And I'm, I'm, I'm surprised and um, uh, very much uh, uh, on the on side of Ukrainians and uh, surprised of um, uh, their, I would say, uh, very, 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 their courage and tough resistance, what they demonstrate for the whole world. The whole world is surprised how uh, 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 tough uh, Ukrainians are defending their motherland. Um, would you um, describe Vladimir Putin and um, his regime as a war criminal and war criminals for what they're doing in Ukraine? And are you um, afraid that um, maybe sending of uh, General Dvornikov to Ukraine will even escalate that situation with the war crimes in Ukraine? No, I don't know about the general and uh, uh, particular whether we, it's a reason or not, but in fact what uh, uh, we can expect, of course, uh, escalation. Mr. Putin needs victory, as I mentioned. That, that is the main, the main reason uh, for him uh, why he invaded Ukraine. Of course, he was misled, and he thought it will be much easier, and uh, and the victory uh, would be just very easy to pick up. But appeared to be not the case. As I said, resistance, tough resistance of Ukrainians shocked him. He didn't expect uh, such a resistance, and uh, then no nobody is going to surrender, and uh, no no going no no one is going to accept Mr. Putin's ultimatums. That's absolutely just uh, misled and, uh, and the wrong perception Mr. Putin has had in the beginning. But right now, we follow it coming to, 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 to the month of May, Nine, 9th of May, Russia's victory day in the world, in, the, in the Europe, in the world, it's 8th of May, in Russia, it's 9th of May. And Mr. Putin needs to demonstrate victory. And that's what. Uh, of course, automatically um, uh, lead us to the conclusion that there should be escalation. And we see just reports of um, uh, different experts that there is a preparation for that. And I think we, we don't know what this victory would be. In any, in any case, just the propaganda would, uh, uh, would develop victory, whatever it happen, happens during this month, uh, before 9th of May. Uh, I think there could be three results. One of them, there's a result of minimum that simply uh, simply uh, expanding the occupied territory of Donbass, 
up to up to administrative borders of uh, these two regions, Lugansk Oblast and Donetsk Oblast. That is minimal. Uh, that will not be seen as a great victory by Russians, but propaganda, of course, will try to develop that victory. Then another uh, uh, goal could be just to create a corridor bet between Crimea and uh, Donbass region. It means just to occupy uh, the whole Donetsk region and part of Kherson region and uh, part of Zaporozhye region to build up this land corridor. That will be given as a victory, but um, uh, of course with the, uh, with the unexpected, I would say, high price. But the largest victory uh, which could be uh, could be achieved uh, if Ukrainians, uh, but I don't think Ukrainians would allow to do this. That's to expand it further, furthermore, to cut Ukraine from the Black Sea completely. It means to occupy not only Kherson but also Nikolaev and uh, up to Odessa. That would that would be just the the the, the dream of many Russian nationalists and uh, Mr. Putin. But I am sure and believe that with the support, uh, military support, what uh, uh, the West right now providing military equipment support, providing Ukraine, I am sure that Ukrainians uh, would be able to uh, to defend and not to allow Mr. Putin to achieve this. But in any case, in any case, just we uh, answer to answer your question. Of course, we all expect just escalation because of necessity to get this some kind of um, uh, victory for uh, Mr. Poole. You didn't answer a part about war criminal. Do you consider him war criminal and his regime war criminal uh, regime? Yeah, what exactly just what uh, happened and we see a lot of already examples and uh, documented facts which we already see in the, in, the, in the western press everywhere of course that is uh, the the the, uh, the criminality that is war, war criminal activity and i think it even uh, 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 crime against humanity some people say about genocide but i don't know just what is the, the facts are, but uh, it's evidently that it's um, uh, uh, crime, uh, war crimes, and uh, and uh, crimes against humanity. That's already the case, and I think that is um, all those people involved, starting with the uh, just uh, simple soldier up to the to, to the commander in chief, should be of course uh, should respond for that. And I think international international uh, special international investigation and an international tribunal should be arranged for that because it's unexpected activity in Europe. I wouldn't say just in the world. It could uh, it even uh, didn't happen in the world, but in Europe in 21st century, that's absolutely uh, unforgivable. Uh, I think I think that's that's the case and that, that's the future. Um, let me ask you also this. We know that there is a huge relationship between Western Balkans region and um, Russia, especially in Serbia, in Republika Srpska, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in times when you were Prime Minister of Russia, current Foreign Affairs Minister Sergei Lavrov was your ambassador to United Nations. And um, in years after that, we had um, other ambassadors in uh, United Nations who gave uh, interesting statements about the region, but many are um, warning us here in the Western Balkans that the Western Balkans might be the next area for destabilization if President Putin doesn't win in Ukraine. Do you believe that he will try to destabilize here or he will just keep this region as a part where he can just poke from time to time a little fires of uh, destabilization, especially in Bosnia? Uh, frankly, I don't think that that is uh, to destabilize the situation in the Western Balkans that would be a priority for Mr. Putin. I don't think so. I think just Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, that would be the target and is a target number one. And in fact, if um, the, the, the West, Ukraine this time, and, and the West uh, supporting Ukraine. If they allow Mr. Putin to win, it means just there will be a next escalation or next provocation, next war in uh, other areas. I think that will be more, it uh, looks more like Baltic states, which is nearby. 
That's why Finland recently and Sweden announced their intention to join NATO to protect themselves. Because just, uh, that's evident that the appetite of Mr. Putin and this politically met person would be expanding on that, on that region. It is difficult to, to invade or do something in the, in, in the Balkans. But of course, the sympathy which uh, uh, Russia has to Serbia, it's always was the case. That's absolutely and continue to be this. But it shouldn't serve uh, to, to uh, help Putin to uh, pursue his wrong, um, just this policy, this criminal activity. That's that. And I think just our friends in Serbia and, and the Balkans in general should understand that, that uh, not all Russians support Mr. Putin and not all Russians just uh, would like Mr. Putin to continue to rule with this activity. We are all part of Europe. We'll be, we would like to be together with all of them, with our friends in, in the Balkans, with our friends in Poland, and our friends in the Baltic states, in Germany, France, etc., whatever. That is, we, we're part, an integral part of Europe, as Balkans are. That's why we should be in cooperation. We should live and build up our future prosperity together, but not 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 um, fight to each other. That's why that's why I'd like to believe, and I'm sure that uh, there is no from the Putin's regime there is no danger for Western Balkans uh, uh, these days. But if we all don't stop Putin, the situation could be different. And um... One last question for you is, I know that you were a friend and colleague uh, with many of the opposition um, leaders in Russia on your Facebook uh, page. When people go there, uh, they can see a picture of uh, Boris Nemtsov, but also of um, Alexei Navalny. Navalny is in prison. Uh, Boris Nemtsov is unfortunately that uh, Vladimir Karamurza is uh, just recently um, imprisoned in um, Moscow. You're the one of those who leads the opposition uh, to Vladimir Putin and his regime. Um, do you think that you will see the day when he's uh, gone and that the democratic forces can do something? But also, are you afraid for your life and life of your family and uh, close associates in a situation like this? Uh, yes, you mentioned completely the right things. Just in fact, um, uh, in fact, the opposition was um, uh, destroyed, especially uh, during all those years. And last year completely, just last year when, when um, uh, the leader of the streets, of the street protests, Mr. Navalny, who is just the, 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 the street protest that is a very important instrument of, of fighting with the uh, regime, it's such an authoritarian regime, uh, what we have now, was uh, he was put in jail without any reasoning, just it's on, on artificial, artificial grounds, political grounds. He's a political prisoner, that's definitely the case. My uh, political partner and friend, Boris himself, was killed just on the uh, on front of Kremlin with a demonstrative manner. That, that is the, the absolute, absolute reality. Uh, and uh, uh, we all, for these 15 years, we were fighting together, together just against um, uh, Putin's anti-democratic grip and trying to stop uh, his anti-democratic just developments. Unfortunately, we're not, we're not successful uh, and that. And we see what we have now. Mr. Putin was very tough because he has a completely different um, uh, uh, values. And uh, he is ready to kill people. He is ready to put them in jail and uh, just to press them and blackmail. And, uh, and uh, 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 destroyment of whole opposition last year, of course, uh, created uh, a, a, a strong feeling of fear. People now just are afraid to demonstrate on the streets. We have, we have of course, demonstrations, just small demonstrations, and, uh, and people, people immediately put in jail and uh, losing, losing their uh, future, I would put this way. And in fact, uh, sooner or later, I'm sure the, that the, the situation will change and uh, will be some kind of reinauguration of democratic democratic movement in Russia. And uh, I'm sure that at least 
30-40% people are prepared for those changes. That is, would be a good beginning. But, um, but um, right now, the ambitions of, um, ambitions of Mr. Putin should be stopped. He should feel and understand that it's not uh, permitted to him to allow this, uh, to, to behave this way in the 21st century. And, and, and I think just that's already, uh, uh, I would say, not achieving the goal he wanted, uh, opening, starting the war with Ukraine, that already will be, I would say, he will, we all will be, uh, he himself would feel himself defeated. And it, it would, would, would mean that uh, uh, will be beginning, beginning of Putin's era end. And I'm sure within a few years that uh, that uh, the, the regime change will ha will happen in Russia with the, by Russian people, of course. Uh, and I, I'm sure that will be the time uh, to reintegrate Russia and to bring her back to the trajectory of building up a democracy and a market economy without without corruption and without lawlessness. What we have every day, every day in uh, unfortunately in our country. Mr. Prime Minister, I would say, Prime Minister, thank you so very much for your time, and it was a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much. It's great to be in your program. Thank you.